Her job is to collect and document the history of Las Vegas at the UNLV Library Special Collections and Archives Division. Sue Kim Chung on the history of Las Vegas and how she is working to preserve it. Support for Nevada Week in person is provided by Senator William H. Hernstadt. Welcome to Nevada Week in person. I'm Maria Silva in for Amber Renee Dixon, who is out on maternity leave. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, her field of expertise include Las Vegas and Southern Nevada history, Las Vegas entertainment, and showgirls. Yes, you heard right, showgirls. Our in-person guest is this week. Uh, she works to collect, archive, and preserve some of our city's rich history, especially as we mentioned our entertainment history. Sue Kim Chung, welcome to Nevada Week in oh, person. Thank Thanks for having me. Thanks for joining us. You have a fascinating job. Tell us a little bit about what you do. So I'm the head of public services, so I work with reference, instruction, and outreach, and I also curate um, historical collections. I reach out to people in the community to collect material um, in entertainment history, um, women's history, and LGBTQ history as well. And let's talk about your love for our city. You have this beautiful book, Las Vegas, and Then and Now. When did your fascination with our city, our dynamic Las Vegas, uh, start? Well, I came here in 1990 for my job as a manuscripts librarian in special collections and archives. And um, I had been, I had studied European history in college and I really didn't know anything about Las Vegas history, but I soon really got absorbed in it. I was working with historical documents and photographs every day. So um, I started in 1999 and they first approached me to do Las Vegas then and, nine, then and now in uh, 2001. And so I didn't know the city as well, but of course I was um, getting to learn more about it and I um, was able to look at the historical photographs in our collection. So that book is actually, there has now been, it's on its sixth, uh, fifth edition, and we've been doing it for 20 years. So there have been tremendous changes. So if you were to look at the first edition of it, it would look very different from the edition today because um, it's changed so much over the years. And let's talk about the, from that first edition to now, the fifth edition, mm -hmm. what is no longer around? Oh gosh, the stardust, the Riviera, um, gosh, there are, uh, downtown, the Las Vegas Club is gone, replaced by Circa. Um, well, the Sahara went to its transition to the SLS, back to the Sahara. So lots and lots of changes um, in, that I've seen, and those are kind of two of the biggest ones. And the Frontier Hotel was also, when I first wrote the, the book in 2002, the Frontier Hotel was still there. Now it's a, it's a vacant, it's a dirt lot. So. Now, we were talking off camera with this edition. Uh, you were able to include something that's very near and dear to your heart. Tell me about that. So typically a lot of the scenes and the spreads in the book have focused on the Las Vegas Strip and Fremont Street. So they're things that are very familiar to tourists. And I, this time I wanted to feature something that was a little bit more for the community, not that it isn't appealing to tourists as well, but I asked if we could include the Arts District. And the, um, the publisher is based in London, so they really don't know a lot of the ins and outs of Las Vegas as much as I do. So I asked about the Arts District and I found, um, I found some, worked with some people who, uh, you know, have businesses in the arts district, and I found some historic photographs. Historic meaning maybe yeah. 10 years ago or so before it became the thriving um, cultural center we see today on Main Street. So Main Street when it was more industrial, when there were more auto body shops and things like that. So I got some wonderful historic images. So we were able to actually do two full spreads on the arts district. Um, so I was thrilled about that to feature some of the public art and the transformations of, of some of the industrial businesses into like thriving like restaurants today. And, and clothing and different kind of retail outlets as well. And what I do love about this book are those photos, those photographs then and now. They're beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I can't take credit for the photos because they do have a photographer that comes, but, but the historic photos we do uh, select from the archives, which are, it's a really fun, fun thing to do. Another great thing that you mentioned here, and again, it's fascinating to me that your fascination with showgirls, where did that come about? What, what made you say, you know what, this is a big part of Las Vegas history, I'm, gonna, I'm going to look into this. Well, partly it's because of my work. Um, uh, one of the very first collections that I worked on and processed and described was the papers of Don Arden, who was of course a, a world famous producer, um, 
of shows, of cabaret shows, who did, who was responsible for Jubilee and the Lido de Paris and the Hallelujah Hollywood. And I also made a friend, my very first friend that I made in Las Vegas was a showgirl who worked at Jubilee. So we ha I had this sort of connection and I learned about it from that angle and then I learned about it historically. So um, that's kind of where my fascination has, has led me and I now, I regularly, um, I, I reach out to people in the community or beyond Las Vegas and uh, people reach out to me to potentially donate materials to really document because as we know there are no more showgirl shows yeah. on the strip so I regularly do um, panels at the Clark County Library in conjunction with special collections where I um, interview people, past performers, um, and we, we relive those days on stage for the people and people in the audience as well. And that's part of your or oral history project that you did. And it, can we have access to that? Can we look into that? Because I mean, I'm fascinated we have as well. Individual, I have done individual oral histories with dancers and also and other people in my division. Um, my colleague Clay T. White has also done um, interviews with dancers as well. These are a little bit different because I have, there's sort of a live um, oral history. It's three people on stage that may have danced in a particular show. Uh, maybe they've worked backstage, maybe they've been a specialty act. So they're kind of on stage and so they're a little different than a one-on-one -on -one oral history. But they're still, they're a lot of fun because there's a lot of people in the audience who may not have seen that performer since they were on stage 20 years ago. Um, and so it's always a big reunion atmosphere at my panels because people are so excited to see um, people they may have not seen for decades. Now you wrote something in an article you wrote for Nevada Magazine. You wrote, she was a city icon who helped Las Vegas become the entertainment capital of the world. The showgirl is a distant memory for most, but there is hope that she will one day return to the stage. Do you ever see that happening? You know, it's, it's really difficult to, to, I think it's a matter of, um, and I think there are other people in the entertainment industry who'd be better suited to be, you know, provide you with a definitive answer. But we know that those shows cost, you know, tens of millions of dollars to produce. And at the time uh, when they were done um, in the 50s and 60s and 70s and 80s, sometimes they were lost leaders for the casino. So you would come in to see the show, but then you would end up gambling. So they kind of relied on maybe if they didn't make money because they had to put out a lot of money to produce the show, um, they had somebody that was going to come in, you know, a couple was going to, husband and wife was going to come in to see the costumes and the beautiful dancers and show girls and then um, the husband or wife would gamble so they would kind of make up that money. So it's a little bit different today. Um, you know, the show the shows kind of are self-sufficient yeah. and they have to be produced. So not a lot of people have that that amount of budget to create one of those big production shows. I mean, we still have, we just still see showgirls, and I don't mean the women who walk down the strip yeah. um, soliciting photographs. I mean, um, the Golden Knights have the, the Golden Bells, who are a lot of uh, former Jubilee dancers are part of oh, the, the, golden, the Golden Bells. Um, and there are certain, uh, I think, um, uh, agencies around town that, um, uh, um, employ former dancers and showgirls to serve, to be part of um, conventions and and things like that. Yeah. But I think there's still the talent out there, as we can see from those shows. Like, so you think you can dance, and a lot of um, there are lots of people with the talent um, and who've studied professional dance. And I think there's probably people out there that could. Um, maybe update um, a show and do the choreography and the producing. It's just, I don't know if it's a matter of financing, okay. um, but I, I would hope one day, maybe there'll be a smaller lounge show that features showgirls. You never know. Like Vive Les Girls, that was a famous show in the late 60s at the Dunes that was uh, choreographed by Ron Lewis. Um, oh, I love that. And it is fascinating and it is, um, I remember working for a lovely, uh, when I was at the MGM, Janet uh, Spellman, for, uh, Ford Spellman. Uh -huh. yes. They probably know her. She was one of her. the beautiful um, oh. principals in Jubilee. She was one of the very first principals in Jubilee when it opened in 1981. Can I tell, I was her assistant at the MGM, and I remember she would glide into the room with such a grace and elegance, and she was tall, blonde, gorgeous, and stunning. And again, she was just the kindest person, but I love that there is that close-knit community. I, I looked her up and I saw that there was a, a group a photo of all of them coming together uh, for the last show. And she was on one of my panels. I did for the the 40th anniversary of the opening of Jubilee in 2021, I did a panel that featured her oh. and Trisha Libowici, who was also a principal. So it was Janet and Trisha, oh, yeah. and then Diana Eden, who was the assistant to Bob Mackey, who was a costume designer for the finale. So we did one of our panels at the, um, 
of the Clark oh. County Library. Hi, so. Janet. She's amazing. She's yeah. amazing. And so much history here. Her family as well with her yes, mom her as mom. well. Yes, her mom. And she is a part. Ford. Yes, her mom is a part of our Nevada Women's Archives. Yes. She was an amazing woman who did a lot, um, created basically the Women's Studies um, Department at, up at UNR. And she also was responsible for a lot of work with the Nevada Women's History Project and the Nevada Women's Archives. Assemblywoman so, and yes, a state senator exactly. as well. Her legacy lives on Gone, that yes. way. Now let's talk a little bit about Nevada uh, women here in Nevada. I was also fascinated to learn that you did your dissertation, correct, mm -hmm. on uh, Jean Weir, who just so happens to be, um, she was the founder of the Nevada Historical Society, correct, which is so fascinating. When did that happen? Back in the day, and the fact that she was already a trailblazer. Yeah, so this was in 1904. She was one of, of, of several founders, but she was the, sec the first secretary for the Nevada Historical Society up in Reno, which was the first repository for historical materials and cultural heritage in the state. So that was 1904. And um, back east, I mean, I had to do, because I did um, my dissertation on this, I know that in back east, the historical societies were generally a men's domain. So I think Nevada is a trailblazer in that our historical society was headed by a woman who was really dedicated her life to the history of Nevada. And it was really due to her work and perseverance and traveling all over the state. Um, and mind you, she had a, her full-time day job was she was a, a professor of history at, uh, at then U University of Nevada. Um, and during her off hours on the weekend and during the summer, she would travel around the state, including Las Vegas in 1905. Um, Eight, I believe. Um, she would travel around and she would um, solicit historical materials. And she did such a phenomenal job. Yeah. Her red journal that you wrote about yes. here in Flies Millions Thick. That's fascinating that you wrote this and, and you document uh, just from July through August of 1908. That's but it's just so fascinating. Yes, she came to um, she came from Reno all the way down to um, Central and Southern Nevada. She met with some of the big movers and shakers. She met Helen Stewart. She met Walter Bracken. Um, she went all over um, Southern Nevada in the attempt to collect history at a time when yeah. we were a very young city. Um, we weren't even really incorporated. It was 1908, so you know the land auction had only taken place in 1905. So it was a very young city, but she saw the importance of documenting um, the whole state and including Southern Nevada at a time when Las Vegas was really very, very yeah. tiny when the population of Goldfield and, and uh, Tonopah was much um, higher than the population of Las Vegas. Just fascinating. She was also involved in the suffrage Bridge movement. movement. Yes. So she was just great. And I love that you wrote about her. And I love that someday someone will be writing about you as well. Oh. Your legacy in the history books. When I write those history books, how oh, would you gosh. like to be remembered? Well, I guess I'd like to be remembered like Jean, as somebody who cared about the state. And, and we're both people who kind of adopted the state as our home. She came from Iowa, and I came from California. Don't, don't hate me for that. <laughs> we don't. Um, and um, did, that came to really love the state and everything it represents and all the important people um, who've, who've made a contribution to the history of, of Nevada. So, oh, um, Well, thank you. Thank you for loving a city that I grew up in as much as I do. And thank you for what you're doing. Again, this wonderful book right now, Las Vegas, and then a noun. You can get this online. Sue Kim Chung, thanks again oh, for joining you're us. Thanks it was so just much for having me. Fascinating. And thank you at home for joining us for Nevada Week in person to see more of Nevada Week in person as well as this week's edition of Nevada Week. Go to VegasPBS.org. Flash Nevada Week. Beautiful book. Thank you. <laughs>